What a week we've had, huh? You, me, six and a half million other people in Houston, and Harvey, who brought us 52 inches of rain, a little bit over 52 inches of rain. That's a lot of rain. And I did find it a little humorous that this is our water ceremony. It's the same every year. The first week in September is our water ceremony. So the irony was not lost on me for sure. So after this long, wet, challenging, frightening, anxiety-producing week that brought a lot of devastation and a lot of loss and a lot of adventure and a lot of gratitude. I want to, as Kenny Loggins said, celebrate you home. I want to celebrate each one of you home. I want to say that you have gone through a harrowing experience. And here, I welcome you home. Welcome to this church, this fellowship, that says you are loved and you are included. And I am so glad you are here. Welcome to this faith, Unitarian Universalism. I call that us the faith of the higher advanced lessons. Because the advanced lessons here are every person has inherent worth and dignity, including you. Every person. We are the faith that says, God bless everyone. No exceptions. Where are the faith? This is no exceptions. Whoever you are, you are welcome and we love you and we see your value as a human being. This is the church that honors whatever truths you have learned in your journey thus far. And we're not afraid to learn from those truths. This is the home that says, it's okay to bring your brain with you when you come to church. We want all of you to show up. And this is the church that says that we are all interconnected. So if one of us hurts, if one of us floods, then the rest of the congregation steps up and says, how can we help? How can we help you? How can we help your brother? How can we help your family that flooded? And so many other families that flooded in our congregation. I want you to hear you are not alone. We are standing with you. This is your home. You are part of this family and not to be forgotten. We celebrate you here. We celebrate you home. And at this time, too, I would like to offer we are here to comfort you. And I also want to welcome you to our annual water ceremony that joins the water from our summer vacations. <coughs> it joins the water from our backyard. It joins the water from our very own hurricane with all the rest of the water of the world. Harvey, after all, started out on the west coast of Africa, just a small drop of water in the ocean. And he came all this way to make us the city in the United States of America, who has had the most rainfall ever. We beat out Hawaii's record, 1950. They almost had 52 inches, and we went a little over. So we won, right? (laughs) Well, I guess it depends on your definition of winning. Because they say that we are going to have $125 billion in damages in this storm of biblical proportion. Now, I don't know about you, but I had several moments during the downpours when it would just kept pouring rain, more rain, more rain. And we have a bayou in our backyard. And I would go out and I would look at that bayou, and sometimes it looked like the Mississippi River. 
And it sounded like the Mississippi River. There was a roar coming through. And I had moments where I thought, any second now, Noah is going to show up. And that ark is going to come around the corner. I'm sure of it. Because I think this is what it must have felt like when it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Remember that story in the Bible in Genesis? That story is often told as a children's story. In fact, it's the number one most popular children's story. Noah and the ark and the flood. If you buy it at the bookstore, it's in a glossy book, and you open it, and everybody is smiling. There are bright colors. Everyone is smiling. The giraffes, the monkeys, the elephants, they are all happy getting on that ark. And at the end of the story, it's the most happy because they're standing on ground again, surrounded by lots of flowers and a beautiful rainbow, and they're all smiling and waving, happy. And you know what? That's a little disconcerting to me because the entire world has just been annihilated. And it's also disconcerting to me because it's what we are teaching our children. Maybe we are not But a lot of people are teaching that story as a wonderful, smiling, waving experience. And that's really not the truth about floods. We know this week that's not the truth about floods. There's no smiling and waving going on when you're up to your chest in water trying to get to the boat, the rescue boat. And you realize that everything that you own is gone. Lots of people had that experience this week. It's frightening. It's a dangerous experience because water is so cool, fresh drink and yet so powerful if we get too much at one time. In fact, at least 45 people have died in this storm, as far as we know as of this moment. So I don't think the story really is a children's story. I think the story in the Bible has a lot more depth to it. I don't think it was meant as a literal story where the giraffes are coming on two by twos. I don't think so. I think it has a much deeper meaning. In fact, I want to read you that story because I think that the stories in the Bible are allegories. They're not meant to be taken literally at all. They have lessons in them for us. So here's the real text from Genesis chapter 6 and 9. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on the earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark out of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. Then he tells them how to build it. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long. Whatever a cubit is, I don't know. 50 cubits wide and 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof an opening one cubit high all around. I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all of life under the heavens. Every creature that has breath in it, everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and the sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. To have every kind of bird, every kind of animal, and every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come with you so you keep them alive. You are also to take all the food 
that is to be eaten, and store it away as food for you and them as well. Now Noah did everything that God said to do. He figured out what a cubit was, and he started building. (laughs) He thought, okay, anybody uh, who's going to flood the earth, I will build the ark. And then it started to rain. For 40 days, the flood kept coming on the earth, and as the waters increased, they lifted the ark high above the earth. The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. They rose greatly on the earth, and all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered with water. The waters rose and covered the mountains to a depth of more than 15 cubits, whatever that is. Every living thing that moved on the earth perished. Birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures that swam and swarmed over the earth, and all of mankind. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a scary story to me. It's sort of apocalyptic. It's pretty dark if it's taken literally. And it's certainly not a children's bedtime story. Who would tell their kids that when God gets mad, he kills everybody on the planet? So don't get God mad. No, I don't think it was written that way at all. I think it was written with lessons for us, allegories. If that's the case, what are the lessons in the flood story? Well, God has a vision. God has this dream of creating a place where people and animals live together in love and harmony. But it didn't turn out that way at all. People turned out to be violent and evil and corrupt, and they messed up his dream. So he decides to just wipe everything out and start over again. And that is the lesson of the flood stories. It's about starting over again. It's about reinventing yourself. It's about getting rid of destructive patterns that don't actually work in your life. That's what the flood story is about. Trying again. And we can all relate to God in this story, right? Because who hasn't here started down a path with good intentions, knowing everything's going to work out, and it doesn't? You ever had that experience in your life? Maybe started a new business, lost your shirt, had a marriage, didn't work out, graduated college and got a boring dead-end job. Ever had those experiences? Friends introduced you to cocaine just one time, and that was one time too many. Yes, we have all had flood experiences where we had all these hopes and all this expectation of it going a certain way, and everything didn't work out. It got wiped out, and we had to start again. We had to build a new house. We had to get sober. We had to really do some introspection and look at what needs to get wiped out from our life. We know how God was feeling. Disappointed, frustrated, angry, upset, overwhelmed, and mournfully sad at the loss. That's what real floods are like, as many of us know who have flooded. In the Genesis story, God fixes everything with a swoop of his hand and starts the rain coming so he can have a fresh slate. He gets rid of that history and just starts over again. As Reverend Peter at the UU Church in Delaware says, the flood is God's great cosmic do-over. Which, by the way, curiously, comes very early in the Bible. It's on page 4 out of 977 pages. 
That means God figured out pretty early, this is not working out. This is not the dream that I had. This is not what I had in mind at all. So he wipes it out, wipes the slate clean. And wouldn't that be nice if we could do that too? Wouldn't it be nice to wipe out some of our history and go back in time and start over again? You know, when our kids were babies and we'd have another shot at raising them, but this time doing it right? Wouldn't it be nice if we could go back and turn left when we turned right and we needed to have turned left? Who would not take the opportunity, if given, to be 20 years ago, 20 years old again, with all the wisdom that you've got, to do it over again? Who here would not say no to that? I know I would jump at the chance. If we could go back and get rid of all the bad decisions and just keep the good ones that worked out like God did, he kept Noah because he was a righteous man. Unfortunately, as mere mortals, we actually don't have that opportunity to wipe everything out and go back and start at the very beginning. But we do have another chance. The actress Mary Pickford said, You may have a new chance any moment you choose. Any moment you choose, you can have a fresh start. Because it's not the falling down that's the problem, it's the staying down. So I want you to think about that. You can have a fresh start any moment you choose. Now some people in our congregation and tens of thousands of Houstonians have sort of had their hands pushed a little bit by that flood, insisting that you will have a new beginning, whether you planned on that or not, because the flood wiped away the old life, and it's time for a new start. In the 2014 movie called Noah, Noah's daughter-in-law comes up. It's pouring. It's raging, raining. And she says to Noah, is this the end of everything? And Noah says to her, no, this is the beginning of everything. This is the new beginning. You see... As UU minister Katie Colbert of Gainesville, Florida, says so well, every shift comes in our life the courtesy of some force, some force pushing us in a direction. Every catastrophe hands us exactly what we need to grow. It can be difficult, for sure. Katie says, I have seen the darkness that results from betrayal and illness, from the loss of a job, from the loss of a loved one, loss from a fire, and loss from a flood. And I have seen all of these function as a gateway to a deeper life, a deeper, more meaningful life. I, too, have witnessed born from catastrophe is a new, deeper life. Rising from the ashes come the phoenix. I know personally, whenever I have been broken, I have always been given a deeper, more meaningful life. I have been transformed. And I believe you that are suffering now with the losses with Hurricane Harvey, are also being transformed right now. Even if you're having another kind of flood besides Hurricane Harvey, you're still in that transformation. I also know that the earth will keep turning. I know that your lives will be rebuilt, and Houston will be rebuilt, and your hearts will heal as my heart will heal as well. But I also know on this homecoming Sunday, right here in this congregation, 
we stand with you, ready to walk with you in your recovery. You are not alone. You are part of this family, and we are here for you. The deep level soul work, it seems we do better if we let other people in to support us. So I am encouraging to let encouraging you to let people in to encourage and support you right now. We are ever ready. I went to John and Linda Wilkie's house on Friday to witness the destruction that two feet of water can do in a house. And John said this profound statement to me. He said, Patty, I'm being forced to learn how to receive. It is so humbling to be given so much. And I am being forced to stretch and to grow and learn how to receive. He said, I feel like Blanche Dubois from A Streetcar Named Desire, that I have to depend on the kindness of strangers. This is the time. Let us in. Let us love you. Let us help you. Let us support you whatever flood that you're going through. Let us truly be your bridge over troubled water. Blessed be and amen. So go now in peace. Do what you can to love and support those who are suffering. And uh, make sure... Do what you can to support those who are in suffering. And remember to let yourself receive if you are one of the people that needs support right now. Go now in peace.